Yeah. All right, all right. So hello, everybody. So welcome to the Cash Flow Empire Tuesday call. So every single Tuesday, as you know, for over a year, we have been doing these calls and we usually bring uh, people with a lot of experience, you know, especially in the in the in the real estate commercial and everything, right? So so today we have a, a, a special guest speaker. So we know Robert for already, you know, over two years. So we have been in, in content communication, right? So he's involved in the in, in the loan part, you know, in the debt side. So as, as you guys know, you know, first is the deal and second is the debt, right? So this is a, a really important uh, thing in, in, in you guys want to scale, right? But let's start the conversation with, with a quick hello, Robert. And if you want to introduce yourself with everybody and just tell sure. us, okay, who is Robert? <laughs> Well, thank you again, Jonathan, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, as I also mentioned, there's folks on here that were just on one of my presentations, as well as some of my students. And I recognize a lot of faces here, of people that I know from Grant Cardone groups that we all attend. And we're all, it, it, it's a team sport. And it's nice to see friendly faces of people that I know. Uh, but who is Robert Damagella? Well, Robert Damagella is currently Vice President of Marcus and Millichap Capital. Uh, I'm located in the Boston office. If you don't know who Marcus and Millichap is, we're a publicly traded real estate firm. Uh, we are probably the largest middle market firm in the country. We trade under the symbol MMI on the New York Stock Exchange. We probably didn't do too well today because the market got crushed today. Um, but uh, the um, the the uh, I also am I've been in business in finance and real estate for over 30 years. Uh, and I have probably financed about $3 billion in debt and equity. And really all I do every day, guys, is finance deals, uh, multifamily, office, retail, uh, industrial, you name it, a lot of multifamily. In addition to that, I also run my own company called America Best Capital, where I actually syndicate multifamily properties. I buy them, I acquire them, finance them, syndicate them, raise the equity, and and I create returns, great returns for investors in my deals. And then most recently, I launched Finance Insider, which you can probably see from my logo here, where I've been training folks how to finance their multifamily properties. Because, Jonathan, back to your point about what you were saying a moment ago, Grant Cardone says there's three most important steps to a deal. And that is, number one, find the deal. And then this particular order, okay, and he is so right. Number two is to finance the deal. Okay, get the debt on the deal. And number three is to then get the equity. And it really should be done in that order. So I've decided to focus on steps two and three because of my background. And actually, funny story for everybody. Jonathan, I don't I don't want to throw their name around, but you will know this person. Her name is Karen. Won't use her last name, but she's part of Grant Cardone. And after spending a couple of events with her talking about re investing, she actually said, look, you have to start an online course because this is the missing link is how to finance a deal is that if you can finance a deal, you can do anything. And what I've done is I've put together Finance Insider to, to drill down to di deep dive on how to finance a multifamily property. That's it specifically. And it's not just underwriting, guys. Underwriting is a part of it. But it's what you do to uh, understand those numbers, to to um, to actually make choices and decisions, to to really be able to figure out what the numbers mean and how to make good choices on investing in which deals and how to make good choices on deals that make sense and don't make sense, et cetera. Uh, it's interpreting the numbers, which is much more important than just plugging in some numbers into a spreadsheet that calculates everything for you. So it's less of an underwriting program and more of a of a knowledge-based, experience-based program on teaching people how to invest in finance multifamily properties. So that's what I do. That's who I am. That is amazing. No, thank you for sharing that, Robert. But, you know, we always tell everybody about the importance of, uh, you know, get educated, right? So it's like, okay, that's the first step, you know, get educated and then just jump into the game, right? So that's, that's what we, we tell every single week to everybody, right? So... And a lo what a lot of people don't know is actually you need to be educated also in the financing side because, you know, there are different strategies, there are different 
uh, structures that you can do in in the financing side. So, so how important do you think that is for for people to get educated in in, in the financing and in the in the loan and debt side? Jonathan, I have to tell you something. It is as I just mentioned a moment ago. It is a missing link. It would be wonderful to have a nice Ferrari sitting in my driveway, but if I don't know how to drive it and I don't know how to operate it and I don't know how to start it up, it's not going to do me any good. You need to, every investor, you got to understand something. If you're out there in the finance marketplace and you're trying to acquire deals, you need to not only know the lingo and the language and what and how to speak to sellers, brokers, lenders, everything, but you also need to know uh, how to structure deals, how to analyze, underwrite, how to optimize deals, how to create a capital stack. Uh, and and remember, if you haven't done the, the, put the work into learning this material, you're up against a guy like me. I'm out there in the marketplace. And I don't want me to sound mean, but I'll eat you alive when it comes to financing a deal. So if you don't put the uh, time and effort into really knowing how to do a deal, you could spend your, your you could spend hours underwriting deals that um, don't go anywhere, uh, or you could spend, uh, buy the wrong deals, or you could just completely miss the market. We're going to be over the next 12 to 24 months. Everybody that follows Grant Cardone knows he's saying this, and I agree. Um, there's going to be a huge market opportunity for deals that uh, need to be refinanced uh, or other things that are happening that you have to take advantage of. If you, uh, if you can't underwrite a deal in five minutes and be able to look at that deal quickly, and move on to the next one if it doesn't make sense, and then be able to react quickly, get on site, be able to understand the numbers, know what questions to ask. You're not, you're never going to be able to be as successful as you could be. I'm not going to say not successful, but you, you'll you never really be as, as successful as you could be unless you really have that skill set. So in answer to your question, how important is it? It is the most important aspect of it because every conversation about every deal is about the finance of the deal. What's the debt? What's the rate? How does the debt service cover? What's is it a suitable loan, not an assumable loan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because once you figure the location, that's one conversation. Hey, it's a great location. And that's the other thing about those three points that Grant says, uh, Jonathan, and why I'm focusing on the finance and why it's so important. Okay. The 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 knowledge to find a deal, okay, and, and honestly, folks. It doesn't take any particular skill set. How does Grant and everybody tell you to find a deal? You're going to make friends with brokers. You're going to call them. You're going to obviously um, get in, in, in and network with them and get on their list. And, and with time, if you've got a good personality and you understand the, the knowledge and the, the vernacular of the business, you'll build a network of brokers that bring you deals. That takes no particular skill set or knowledge. It's just almost a networking experience, okay? And the ability to talk to people. But the ability to finance a deal, the ability to be able to look at a deal and and, and interpret what the numbers mean or understand that, you know, the, the cash flow numbers just don't look right or it's not going to be a syndicatable deal because the numbers aren't there, et cetera, et cetera. That takes a real skill set. And to raise equity takes a real skill set. I was on Wall Street for 20 years. The first deal I cut my teeth on, Jonathan, was Rockefeller Center Properties in New York City back in the late 80s. And that's where I learned how to syndicate. It was a first publicly traded REIT. And I got in there and I raised equity for that deal back in the late 80s. And honestly, uh, those, 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 that knowledge and skill set is irreplaceable. So uh, of the three, no specific knowledge needed to, to find deals, but you got to be an expert in financing the debt and the equity and which lenders to go to, et cetera, et cetera. You, and I, I, you know, I think that's pretty clear from my viewpoint, you know? Love it. Love it. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for sharing that, you know, but, but, you know, we, we, we tell everybody again, right? So it's just about, you know, community. We're already sharing information every single week. Uh, one of those uh, things that we share all the time is like, okay, you, in order to start in this business, so you need to build your team. Right. So you need to build your team uh, and then you need to start looking for properties. You need to get financing and everything. Right. But but let's say that, you know, for a, for for somebody that is looking to start. Right. So somebody that is already looking into deals, finding deals, 
So what is what are those requirements or how people can be ready to actually get financing as soon as they, they get a deal? What are the steps or, or you can walk me through through that part? Yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. And I and I think that's a great question because, um, you know, uh, you know, outside of the programs that I teach, which setting that aside, we can talk about that later. But the point is that, you know, we we take folks uh, that are new and we, we hold their hand right through the program, train them on how to finance deals. And then we get them into a group setting where they can like the real estate club where they can bring their deals for evaluation. And that gets them on a fast track with their hand held to obviously get out there in the marketplace and start to find deals. But if, outside of that, you know, what you need to do is you need to go out and build some relationships with some lenders. Um, and this is from a finance perspective. Obviously, you need to understand how to syndicate a deal, understand the terms like a key principle, because if you don't have the net worth yourself, you will need to bring in folks that have enough net worth to be able to support um, raising capital or getting the debt on the deal. In addition to which, you might want to go find yourself a good, reputable mortgage broker, a real estate broker, a mortgage broker. OK, build that team, an accountant. And also some start to uh, put together lists of people that might have an interest in investing in your deals. But until you um, really get all those pieces together, uh, it, it becomes a little difficult. But you don't want to lose. You don't want to uh, have just analysis paralysis and you wait till you have a team to get started. Go out and start to find deals. And what you said, Jonathan, is so important is the education. I mean, really is. If you you have to invest in yourself. You have to be willing to take the time to gain the knowledge to be able to be successful because it is a very, very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Intellectual game. You have to be able to see a deal financially, not even on paper, understand what it's, what, what the numbers mean and how you're going to be able to structure a deal. So you're standing on site and you say, wow, I see it has this extra cap asset or building and the rents might be low. And okay, if I take those square feet and understand the big picture. So to get started, yeah, build a team, get yourself in touch with lenders, equity, or find yourself a good program like the one that I'll share with you in a bit of how we can help you to, to learn from ground zero, uh, or even for experienced folks, how to scale up, but from ground zero, how to start, find, underwrite, understand, and make offers on deals and then go to closing and, and obviously build your portfolio because the wealth building is incredible. You know what I mean? That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Robert. Thank you for sharing that. So, so now uh, you, you say something earlier that it just caught my attention, right? So, yep. and I'm sure everybody, <laughs> you know, heard this many times, right? That the next 12 to 24 months are going to be probably the biggest, you know, like, you know, opportunity in history for, you know, commercial real estate, multifamily and all the above. So do you think that you can walk us through, you know, how the market is right now and what are your thoughts about, you know, what's going to happen in the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Exactly. Um, first of all, understand that um, I work at Marcus and Miller Chap Capital. Um, here, here's their most recent updated uh multifamily research package for 2024. I don't know if you can see that on the screen or not, but uh, it just released the other day. And so we have very robust real estate uh, uh, research. Now, where I think we are in the cycle is the following. Uh, the the, the uh, inflation numbers came out today. I think it was today or yesterday. I lose track sometimes, uh, but I think it was today and they were worse than expected, okay? Roll back to the end of last year, the Fed came out and said that they were going to reduce interest rates three times in 2024. And then they came out uh, shortly thereafter and said that they've reduced their expectation by 50, I believe it was 50 percent of those great reductions. And now inflation has now come out and it's reared again its ugly head. So our interest rates coming down, they may not come down till the end of the year. They may not come down till next year. I don't know. It's not looking great. The stock market got crushed today. It was down at one point over 750 points. And remember, the stock market was had, was up about 1,100 points for the year, and it now was down 750 for the day. So it gave back almost all the gains. I don't know where it closed. But, you know, that's where we are. Now, everybody is hoping for. We had started to see the um, employment numbers slow, 
and the economic growth numbers slow. And we were seeing um, the um, uh, the numbers, uh, the, the economy looks like it was going to slow down. We were expecting or have been expecting and still are, as, as Marcus and Millichap, we're expecting a soft landing. What does a soft landing mean? The Fed raises interest rates in order to cool down the economy. Historically, what's often happened is that that's putting the brakes on a car that's going very fast. And sometimes that car goes into a skid, might smash into a wall, and uh, and it, it really it's called a, a recession, right? Okay. So, but in the case of a soft landing, you're braking slowly, you come to a stop, and, and you and you safely. Uh, stop moving forward. And that's what we are hoping for so that the economy just doesn't crash. And if we can get a soft landing, I think that's extremely positive for all of us as Americans to be able to enjoy a good economy, have rates come back down again and get more reasonable. Now, in terms of actually real estate, specifically commercial real estate and multifamily real estate, uh, I would tell you that uh, I think that you're still looking at major opportunities in the next 12 to 24 months, okay? Uh, I've been through many cycles uh, over the 30, I hate to admit it, close to 40 years in finance and real estate. I've been through many, many cycles. In fact, one of them I will tell you about uh, caused me to uh, lose all my money. And that was based on the, the crash of um, uh, the subprime crash. I was running a hundred million dollar hedge fund and the market crashed and I lost all my wealth, but I built it back by investing in multifamily properties by using my wits and skill to be able to finance multifamily properties with other people's money. And my first deal coming out of that meltdown was I, I made a million dollars, one deal, other people's money, because I know how to finance deals and you should know how to as well. But where was I going with that? So I was talking about where we are now and this cycle that we're going into where there's going to be uh, a bunch of uh, real estate coming on sale. OK, why is it going to be on sale? I'm going to explain it to you as uh, simply as possible. OK. And the uh, basic way to understand it is people took out debt on a, on a property. Let's just say a 10 million dollar property with seven and a half million dollars in debt. Okay, that's 75% loan to value. Does everybody understand that? Okay, right? All right. Now, the interest rates, and they might have taken a bridge loan, let's say, because they wanted to, for whatever reason, get the rents up. They thought they could get the rents up. Okay? So they took a bridge loan at a higher interest rate. And now, um, or even if they had a lower interest rate and the debt's coming due, either way, the rents maybe didn't go up. So they've got debt coming due. Either way, they've got to refinance that debt. But now the way the property is cash flowing, it doesn't debt service cover for that seven and a half million dollars in debt. Because at three and a half, they could borrow seven and a half and cover their debt service. But at six and a half, it won't debt service even that amount of money anymore. So they've either got to maybe write a check. I'm making up numbers, but maybe it's seven and a half to six and a half now. But it'll only support six and a half million in debt. They got to write a check for a million dollars or sell the property. And they're, in many cases, maybe they'll just sell it to get out of their debt. They're going to take a hit on their equity, but they're willing to do that because remember, equity is in a first loss position. Debt always must be paid back. So that's where we are, is that we're in a point in the, in the cycle right now where we're going to see a correction and people's debt coming due, refinancing's coming due, where people just can't refinance at current rates in a way that's uh, uh, beneficial to them and will sell deals just to get out of them. And that'll be all of our opportunities on here, especially if you know how to finance a deal. Does that answer your question? 100%, 100%, I love it, I love it. Thank you for sharing a, a little bit about the insights and the market. And and again, guys, you know, biggest opportunity in history is coming. So we need to be ready, we need to be educated, we need to submit LOIs, we need to know how to do the underwriting. We need to build a team, right? So we need to be ready for that. So that's that's the whole purpose. That's why we started doing this over a year ago for you guys to become educated, to get, you know, get ready for, for whatever is coming, right? So, but yeah, but Robert, I mean, you know, a lot of people, and I was one of them, uh, you know, you guys read the news, right? So we follow the real deal and all this, uh, you know, like 
you know, whatever resources are out there posting about these these people that actually uh, are losing deals, right? Those that are going into foreclosure, right? So, so do you think like you can you can share a little bit because you know I know it's a concern for everybody and probably people have this question why why these people are losing the deals what why mistake what mistake they 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 made right so in order to lose those right so uh, right. from the financing side what do you think are, are were those mistakes that these uh, operators did so. Well, there's a lot of mistakes that people make when they think that they know how to invest in a deal. Uh, for one, one mistake people make, and this is uh, based upon poor character, uh, is they decide they're going to syndicate, but their goal is to syndicate to just capture the structuring fee. Okay, so the deal made okay sense; they were able to get debt on it, but their goal was to capture their two or three percent structure fee on a ten or twenty million dollar deal and let the market take them out. All right. And guess what? The market's not taking them out anymore. The deal didn't make that much sense. Or maybe they took a high interest loan short term thinking they could get rates to get the rents up and they can't get the rents up. And now their 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 debt is coming due and the deal still is not making sense. So for the reasons I just mentioned to you before, it uh, most of it has to do with debt coming due. That is not really financeable based on current rates. That doesn't make that much sense or that their their whole market plan, their whole uh, uh plan for uh, creating value, uh, they either haven't executed on it or they, uh, they, 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 they can't. And furthermore, making mistakes in the underwriting, not sticking to principles like making sure you've got a minimum uh, cash on cash return, five or 6% at least, which we drive home to our, our group, 6%. I demonstrated on the call before this that I was on a deal that I bought, the one I mentioned to you, where I made a million dollars in that very first deal coming out of the subprime meltdown. I bought it with a 6% cash on cash return and pay my investors a 6% uh, prep rate. Now, there are some investors that say they don't connect the two. They buy a deal, the cash on cash is two, but they promise their investors six. Now what? That's not going to work. And they find themselves trying to catch up. They're in arrears on their, on their uh, prep rates. And, and again, more deals where they don't work. You need to know the finance and you need to understand all the moving parts and all the levers that you can you can uh, turn or twist to get a deal to work right. Uh, and many deals you can get, Jonathan, to work, but you just got to know how to get them there. And uh, the bottom line is that uh, these are some of the reasons why uh, people are failing uh, out there. And I think uh, there's uh, in some cases people that don't have the knowledge or experience that have uh, managed to acquire a deal and where the numbers don't actually really work that well. Love it. Love it. That's amazing. No, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and I think it's important to understand this, right? You know, because I don't want to make those mistakes, right? So so we need to understand deeply, you know, what happened there, right? So so thank you, Robert, for for sharing that. So if you guys having uh, are having fun today, so make, make sure that you're posting and show some love to Robert, you know, because he's giving his time to be with us tonight. So, you know, he's a really busy guy, right? He's he's always uh, around spreadsheets about, you know, all of this and, and conversation and the fun. So it's it's actually, uh, you know, uh, kind of, he's busy, right? So it's, it's a little hard to to get, get get a hold of him, but, but he's... Uh, putting his time to today to bring uh provide value to to all of you guys so you, so before i go to tiago and again guys if you have any questions feel free to raise your hand uh you know to ask robert again you know he's he's open to share his knowledge and his experience but but robert like you so for people to understand this like okay you know it, we're more familiar with the residential side right like for example if i want to get ready to get approved for a loan for a, for a single family. So I need to get, you know, my good credit score. I need to go, you know, like uh, my W-2, my tax returns and everything. So what is the difference between the process of a residential uh, and actually commercial, like real estate? What, what are those steps that people need to do in order to get uh, ready to, to be approved for a loan uh, outside uh, the deal? Uh, that's such a great question. And everybody on this call is going to is going to hang up on the call in a minute when I say what I'm going to say. But I'm going to tell you, I've been doing this for 30 years. I financed three plus billion dollars in debt and equity. And let me tell you something. It's easier to acquire and finance a multifamily property with multiple units of 20, 30, 50 or 100 than it is to finance a house. 
You don't even need to have a credit score. You can have no credit or bad credit and still be able to finance a multifamily property. Most people don't realize that. And what is the reason? The reason is you, uh, in a multifamily property, your lender, especially the agency lenders, Fannie and Freddie, they're depending upon the um, collateral as their real security. They're, they're saying, hey, this is a 50 unit apartment building. I've got 50 rents coming in. You're buying a house. You got one guy working, maybe him and his wife. And if they don't pay the mortgage, they've got a foreclosure. But you know what? If you lose five tenants in a 50 unit apartment complex, that's only 10% vacancy. It's still going to pay the mortgage. So in all sincerity, you really have an easier time. If you can put together a good team, like you say, a KP with a strong net worth, or your own, uh, the amount of capital that you need through perhaps a syndication, a JV, or seller financing, or one of the 15 ways that we share with our with our our, our students on how to uh, creatively finance. Um, if you can do that, have a better chance of buying a multifamily property. It'll provide you with wealth growth, uh, passive income, tax benefits, and more. And it's easier to do than a multifamily property. But you have to understand how to finance a deal. And that's really the case. And I also want to mention to you, Jonathan, uh, about bridge debt these days, because bridge debt, uh, and does that answer your question with that, by the way, before I move on to bridge debt? And then I know Tiago has a question. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and I'm excited to talk about, you know, difference between, you know, like what, you know, kind of loans, you know, fixed rate, you know, like bridge debt, right? So so do you want to do you want to touch that uh, right now or do you want to go ahead and, and answer a couple of questions before you go there? Uh, Jonathan, I'm at your disposal. So if you want to hit on that, fine. If not, I can yeah, pick yeah. up. Perfect. Let's, let's go to Tiago. Go ahead, Tiago, man. How are you doing? Tiago. No hard questions, Tiago. They're not allowed. <laughs> hey, I'll be easy on you, Robert. I'm just a newbie here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for being here with us and uh, your precious value. It's bringing a lot of uh, information already. But the question I have, Robert, uh, a lot of the people here, they're starting new or get involved in the multifamily. And I see the struggle of, you know, people that are trying to plug in into a team. Um, they have to get, you know, bring some value to the team, most likely at times capital with them to be integrated as a, you know, a new participant. But as a new group, let's say someone that approaches a bank or a broker, what would be the best approach or which banks to approach since you don't have that much experience yet and not so many brokers or banks wanted to talk to the newbies? Right, right, right. I think I understand your question. I mean, how should your team look to approach debt and in debt lenders or, or commercial real estate finance brokers? Is that right? Yes, as a new as a new sitting cater. As a newbie, yeah, for sure. Look, somewhere along the way, you've got to find if and, and this is assuming that you don't have a strong balance sheet. Is that right? Okay. So assuming you don't have a strong balance sheet, you need to find yourself someone who has a strong balance sheet. And 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 I'm gonna make it simpler for you than you think. Even though you want to talk about bringing value, right? Well, you need to find, it, 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 I, I, I'm extremely experienced in this space. And if you were, you, Tiago, were to come to me as a newbie and say, hey, Robert, uh, I've got this deal, right? Now, here's the key. You have to understand how to look at the numbers and look at what the potential returns can be. So if you can do that, what's your value? Your value is, I brought you a deal. Look at this. It's got a 18% internal rate of return potential. It's got a two and a half times equity multiple. It's in a great location. Um, and I've got this deal either under contract or I can get it under contract. Do you want to be a KP in my deal and part of the general partnership? Why wouldn't I say yes? Why wouldn't I want 20 to 40% of that deal with those kind of numbers? The 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 bad conversation, Tiago, is hey, I found a deal. I, I just know it's a great deal. It's in a great location. You got to see this deal. And and the guy's going to look at you like, yeah, okay, great. So it's in a great location. But they want to see, investors want to see returns. What Grant tells you all the time. So that's an easy way to approach a wealthy guy is to say, I've got something. 
that I think could really make you a lot of money, but I need a KP who's going to join me in the GP. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. And the other thing with the KPs, the ones that are signing the loan, what is the minimum net worth to to be a KP? A meal over, a half a meal over, two meals? What would be a, a average number you see out there? It all depends on the deal, Tiago, because if you're going to buy a 100-unit deal for 25 million bucks, right, you're going to have to have a stronger KP than you are if you're, if you're getting together on, you know, 30 units in, uh, you know, on Miami Beach. And that could be a high price product anyway. It's all dependent. I'll give you an example, though, of the kind of things that you can expect. If you're going to use an agency lender, I don't know if everybody knows what agency is, but that's Fannie and Freddie. Okay. Agency lender, for example, requires that you have nine months of mortgage payments liquid post closing, as an example of net worth and liquidity, right? So now, if you're buying a 100 unit building, that has a $25,000 a month mortgage payment, well, they're gonna be looking for that times nine. But if you're buying a smaller property, it's gonna obviously be less. So, uh, you know, you you want, that that's an answer to your question. It, it all depends. And much in this business, all depends. Okay? Got it, got it, understood. And the other thing, um, Robert, uh, I believe you're a broker. Is that what kind of you do there, like a, as a loan broker? Yes, I have a fancy title. I'm a vice president of Marcus and Millichap, but technically I'm a mortgage broker. Okay. okay. And I have clients and they bring deals in. For example, yeah, they'll bring me deals and I'll get them financed. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've probably done a quarter of a billion dollars in financing. Uh, in my program that I have that I will talk about after is uh, I, sh I actually help my students finance their deals if they would choose to do that. So that's what I do. I go, I have hundreds of lenders at my disposal. Marcus and Millichap is a powerhouse. They all want to do business with us. So we bring a lot of power to getting deals financed. Got it. one question that, uh, you know, Brad Sunrock, sometimes he speaks about the banks not to go. <laughs> and it's within the community. It's not an open talk. But would you have a couple banks that say, hey, you know, those two banks, uh, good reference, they're, you know, good to work with i i don't know you don't, you want to give any preference but just two names so we can kind of focus on them you know i first of all i wouldn't want to say anything negatively about any lenders so i wouldn't do that okay but specifically to your question yes there are lenders brad spoke at one of my events uh about a month or so ago and uh i remember he mentioned that at that point i believe as well but i know he said that and yes there are lenders you don't want to go to and uh some of them are uh, lenders that you might be familiar with. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example. This is not a bad example, okay? This is doesn't, if you've heard of TD Bank, right? Yeah. All right, they're a great lender. Canadian but, Bank. Right, but their problem with TD Bank is they're extremely conservative, very check your box, okay? And you can waste a lot of time trying to get uh, a deal done with them and because often deals have hair on them or they're not so black and white, right? Or you as a new sponsor aren't so black and white. And you as a new sponsor are going to have less likely if they're very strict. So without saying anything wrong about TD, they're a great lender, but they just tend to be one that a newbie may not want to spend his time on because they tend, they look for very high, uh, very, very much uh, lower LTVs, higher debt service coverage ratios, uh, those kind of things. And that's often hard to achieve uh, for someone who's starting out, okay? Uh, appreciate it. You're welcome. Good, good questions. Good questions, Tiago. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. Thank you, Tiago. Uh, Great uh, questions, uh, but they're too hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and you guys, uh, you guys hear Robert, right? So it's uh, first of all, you know, I, I just grow down like, you know, it's it's easier to get financing for a multifamily that actually for uh, residential real estate. So that that's amazing. You, you guys, yep. that's mind blowing, right? So that's. That's one of those things. And the second thing that you mentioned, Robert, there is actually, you know, when we say multifamily is a team sport that's related with, okay, if you find a deal now, who do I need to bring to my team that will cover the liquidity and the net worth, right? That's how you start building your team, right? Yeah. And Robert, his role is a, is a, is a really just for you guys to understand, you know, Robert has, a, a, has been doing this for over 30 years. 
So he has a, already relationships building with, with different banks and any entities. So where you basically, instead of just going, you and uh, shopping bank by, by bank and trying to build a relationship to get approved for a, for a mortgage, for a loan, for a multifamily, Robert, he's already have uh, all that experience and, and, and those relationships that are already built there. So, so Robert is, is basically bring, bringing to you the best options that you see out there in the market. Is, is that correct, Robert? Yeah, yeah. We'll bring you, if you decide you want to work with, I suggest anybody new, especially, gets themselves a competent broker. Look, uh, it's a full-time job for me to finance deals. So what would make you think that that's the job you want to do, right? You want to hire somebody that's an expert and has relationships. So if you can get a broker who's uh, reputable, competent, hire him to source your debt. And if you want to come to me, we can source your debt too. Uh, that's not a problem. It has to fit criteria for us that I won't go into now, but you know, minimum loan size, whatever. But um, yeah, definitely an absolute must. And when we did take an assignment, just to give you, we we will present you with you know three to six minimum debt quotes from various lenders in the country. So you have a menu of options with different maturities and different terms, different interest rates, some IO, some not IO, some with, uh, you know, uh, you know, all different options uh, that you have. And then you can just pick the one that works best for you. And that's definitely a must. If you're a newbie, you definitely want to get out there and find yourself a, uh, a good mortgage broker. So, Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Go ahead, Jimmy. Hey, Welcome Jimmy. Hi, Robert. Hey, Jonathan. Hey, uh, thanks for a great call and a lot of great information here, Robert. And I have a question on, uh, since you were mentioning KPs earlier, uh, would would the bank take like a fund to, I know if they're looking at the balance sheet of a person, would they take a fund as a net worth of somebody? So basically, you're not signing as a person, but you're using an LLC to sign as a KP. Would that work? Um, you know, and those answers go to depends. I mean, usually they're looking to a, a person to turn to. Uh, and I don't normally come across that kind of a structure. Uh, but I would, you know, there are institutional investors out there that they're definitely, you know, uh, BlackRock is not, you know, the president of BlackRock is not signing on as an, as a, guarantor on a loan. We're talking middle market investing here versus large. I think if you're doing larger deals, that's probably likely and typical and not unusual. But if you're talking about, you know, Jimmy, uh, Tiago and Jonathan getting together to do a deal and, you know, Jimmy wants to put up his fund for a, a hundred unit apartment complex, that's probably not going to happen with the local community bank. Makes sense. Okay. I was just thinking that if we have, let's say, for example, a fund that have $10 million that have properties in there and they're using that as a uh, as an LLC to sign. And they might ask you to put up the assets as collateral and say, hey, you know, you put up some collateral or you put a large deposit into the account or something. There's, a, you know, I, I try to keep this. I mean, there is there are uh, more institutional ways to invest in this business. I'm trying to keep this at the... Um, the middle market, uh, private investor level. Uh, I'm not, you know, I don't mind the question. I'm just saying, I don't think that um, in this case it'd be applicable, but this pro and I will tell you, you will find a lender that'll work with you in some way, shape or form that that's not impossible. That's where you want to, if you brought me a deal and you wanted to do that, I'd find somebody for you. That's awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. You're awesome. welcome. Uh, and that's a funny thing. Like th th this is a this is a small world, Robert. Like pretty much, you know, a lot of people. You, like everybody know each other. So, so when yeah. you say that uh, you will bring somebody to, to somebody like Jimmy, right? That that can solve his 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 his, his scenario, right? Of, of closing the deal in that way. Uh, I'm sure you have somebody there. Uh, but yeah, we have a, a question from uh, uh, Sana. How, how are you, Sana? Go ahead. Hi, Santa. How are you? Hi. Santa? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Good. Thank you for the question. What's going on? Yes. Thank you for taking my question. So I have a question. Uh, actually, two questions. Uh, do you fund small deals like two or three families? Do or I just finance? Big? Yes. No, uh, I'll tell you what I'm financing right now that is on the smaller side. I have a group, um, uh, and a portfolio, uh, 
about 150 units. Uh, but it's all twos, threes, sixes. It's a portfolio. Individually, a portfolio. if you come to me with two units or three units or even four units, that's too small. We generally work on a minimum of a, a million dollar for financing. Okay. Um, but um, so, so in answer to your question, the smaller stuff is not really in my wheelhouse. Okay. Not so, stand alone. Um, That's a larger portfolio, yes. Okay, understood. So uh, does it make sense to go to a private lender for smaller deals or do you recommend go to the bank? Go to the bank. Go to your residential. Okay. If you're going to buy a two family, go to your residential lender. It's going to be a residential loan anyway. Oh, it's considered it's residential. Commercial. Yeah, it's going to be residential. Two, three. I think uh, Massachusetts is minimum of five it goes into commercial. Uh, and I okay. think a lot of them in the country are like five units or above. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you very much. Yep. No love it. Love it. Good question. Good question. Okay. Uh, Robert, so let's let's talk a little bit about, you know, the bridge loans, fixed rates and everything because, you know, I want to make sure that people understand, you know, like, you know, what are the differences? What are the advantages? What are the pros, cons and everything, right? So, especially because, you know, again, just coming back to the these foreclosures and, and these people in trouble, you know, it's because they got, of course, you got, they got a really like low interest rate. And of course, if they got a, a floating rate, I mean, they just went to the sky, right? But what about now that the interest rate are high? You know, do you consider that as a, as a good option? Yeah, no, I, look, and I'm, I'm going to go back to share about our finance training course because that's a lot of what we teach in there, okay? I actually have real live lenders come on the call, on our calls, on our meetings, and I have lenders from a community bank. Let's say the most recent was a $20 million community bank for standard lending for your per per permanent loan, five, seven, or 10-year debt, uh, cash flowing assets. I then bring in agency lenders, Fannie and Freddie. They get on the call and they will talk to the uh, students about what the lenders look for, uh, what the, the type of deals, the type, what they look for in a sponsor, okay, KPs, et cetera. And I brought in a bridge lender. This is where I'm going with this. And he talked about the products that they have that are appropriate for them. So these are all, you need to decide on the kind of lender you need. And then these are tools or arrows in your quiver that you need to pull out at the right time. And as far as bridge lenders go, bridge lenders have a very specific role uh, in deals. And in fact, last week, uh, we have a club where we meet as part of our program every week to talk about the financing of a deal. People, the, the students are bringing their deals for us to look at the underwriting and evaluate them, okay? This deal came in and he had it underwritten as permanent financing, basically, uh, uh, I think it was five or seven year debt he, he, he had it as, but it was wrong because he needed a million dollars in value ad work. So that means he was going to have down units and he was going to have restricted cash flow until those units came online, got turned and the rents up. Okay. That is what's called a value add deal. So we reworked his, his underwriting from permanent to, to value add. And then did a five-year projection because the the story with um, uh, bridge lending is that you're buying it, and usually here's the terms: like seventy or seventy-five percent of your acquisition price, of your acquisition cost, and then they'll give you a hundred percent of your rehab money, and then the whole thing, your acquisition debt and your rehab money, have to roll into one loan. Let's say after two years with interest only that you got. And you've got to be able to get a value high enough, your rents up high enough, cash flow up high enough to re to be able to cover that conversion or refinance to permanent debt. So if you bought it for ten million and it borrowed seven seven uh, seven point five million, and you borrowed a million dollars to do rehab, you need an eight and a half million dollar loan, and you need the cash flow and debt service to cover that eight and a half million. In the meantime, you have interest only. In fact, most people don't know that you don't even always have to have a, a 125 debt service cover when you're using bridge debt. Now, important, your the real point of your question was people got in trouble with it. They got in trouble with it because they used it for the wrong reasons. But if you have a deal that you're able to sit down and understand the financing and you're able to look at the current cash flows, project out the amount of work you need to do, and then 
be able to do a five-year projection, which we do on the models that we provide in our program. We give you all the models that we use to underwrite deals. Um, you're able to do that. You can see that you're able to get in, get out, and exit the deal and into permanent financing where you can own it and experience the growth of that property. That has to be done right. Like any one of these deals, it just has to be done right. And if you know the numbers, I have a saying, any, any of you follow me on Instagram, every one of my Instagrams ends with, it's all in the numbers. Because it's all in the numbers. Awesome, awesome. So, so Robert, what you're saying right now is that Let's say that you 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 acquire a property with a with a good discount, right? So that's already a win right at the beginning. And also, right. you are really conservative in your numbers and projections, where you clearly know that you can increase rents by uh you know adding value and fixing the place. So it does it make sense to get a, a let's say a bridge loan that it's a little bit more expensive, right? I mean the interest rates are probably two, two or three points more, you know, oh, with yeah. rate 10, cap, right? Yes, yes. Exactly, you know, so uh, does it make sense for people to do this in the right way, like you're saying, right? Because you are really sure that you can do that, right? And yes. then later on, you can uh, uh, get a permanent debt, like maybe in one or two years, maybe in three. We don't have a crystal ball to know what's going to happen, but everybody's expecting that it will be a, a, a decent lower rate that is right now. So what you're Jonathan, saying is that makes sense. Yeah, you couldn't be more right. You know your business inside and out. That's very clear and, and very obvious to me. But no, that is the answer. You need to be able to look at the deal, get it at a decent enough discount, uh, and know that you have upside. If I can give you an example quickly, I actually was uh, trying to acquire a property here in Boston uh, a month ago. I didn't get the deal. But long story short, understand that this was an A++ location, but it was only five units. But the five units had a, had cash flow numbers that if I bought it where I bought it, I would be able to double the rents. It actually was vacant. It needed 200000 in work. So you bought it, you put in 200000 The rents were half of what they should have been because they owned it for since the 1980s. Release it at double the rents. And my value, I would have made a million dollars just by re-renting it. It's a very low cap rate market. If you understand the numbers, I knew I could buy this even vacant with bridge money and make money. So, it, it yes, it's, there's a, it's a tool to be used properly like any tool and not to be uh, abused because that'll get you in trouble. You're right. That's awesome. That was, that was fire. You know, that was bombs. You know, thank you for sharing all, all those things because... It's, again, it's important to be, first of all, because everybody have the right team, be ready, educated and everything. But but yeah, I mean, Robert, thank you. Thank you, man, so much for, for sharing your, you know, your, your point of view, your knowledge and every, you know, with everybody. So uh, for you guys out there, uh, again, yeah, you know, I, do, do you want to share, do you want to share, Robert, uh, any information or something about how people can contact you or, you know, just uh, ask you some questions further? So. Yeah, yeah, I don't mean to interrupt you and step on your sentence. I wanted to mention to you, Jonathan, that we are having a, a webinar uh, sharing three secrets of financing multifamily deals. In fact, uh, there's some uh, folks on this that were on the webinar tonight, and I'm sure they'd share with you how great it was. Um, and we're going to have that on the 20th, okay? There's a QR code here uh, on my screen that you can get in a registration in there for that. And we're going to talk about all this information and more three secrets on how to finance multifamily properties. And you can either uh, text uh, to that number, you can text the the, uh, the name uh, word webinar, okay, to that number, or you can use the QR code. And for anybody that decides to sign up, uh, I will give them this free uh, Marcus and Miller chap book that goes into probably 40 or 50 different uh, uh, markets and talks specifically about uh, every detail of that market, the cap rates, the market forecast, the value of the properties in there. So if you get in there and you sign up, uh, you use the word webinar and we'll, uh, uh, and, and text the word webinar rather, we'll send this over to you, but you can, you can also sign up for our webinar by using the QR code. It's free of charge, but I'd love to have you on there. We can share with you about our programs and about how we can help you become an expert, a pro at multifamily finance. Okay.
Lost sorry, you. I was mute. I was mute. <laughs> sorry, okay. sorry, uh, Robert. Thank you. Thank you so much, man, for for sharing that. I think Erma was asking. Okay, what is the what time zone is? I seen two o'clock, but what is the time zone? I'm an Eastern what, Standard. What? I'm nine o'clock here. All right, sounds good. So Easter time. So okay, great. So so thank you again, Robert, for for sharing that with everybody. So again, guys, just get educated, right? And Robert is offering uh free resources. So and he has a lot of experience. So so make sure that you guys connect with him. If we're gonna be providing you a lot of value, and who knows, right? What about he get you financing for a for a deal, right? As soon as yeah. you know later on. So that's that's the whole purpose of of this call, right? Bring Robert, and in the future, you guys can partner with Robert in a deal, right? So that's the whole purpose of of us in this community. But 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 thank you uh, everybody for being here. Uh, gonna stop the recording. So thank you so much, guys. Uh, we're gonna do a breakout room. So we'll see you next next uh, Tuesday.